Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ruth. We appreciate that. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter. We're going to be looking at this interesting book and uh, going through this, and we're going to take our time and looking at some things. But today we're going to talk about three things that God gives us. Now, I want you to think about this. You know, um, we used to watch a kid's movie. I'm not going to name it. But it had a genie in there that would grant you three wishes. And, folks, that's not how things work. I'm sure some of you know the movie that I'm talking about, if you have kids. I don't like to promote some of those things. But, you know, God gives us three things that are real and that changes lives. You know, this is what God's Word is all about. This is what God wants to do. He wants to have things grow in our hearts. You know, there's actually, according to the Word of God, three different classifications of Christians. There's a baby Christian. That's, those are ones who just get saved and they're growing in the Lord. And then the next one's the young men or young women too. And that's the one where uh, they're a little bit more mature. They're growing a little bit. They're doing things. And then comes the adult Christian. This is the one who's supposed to be following the Lord and, and growing and doing what God wants you to do. I want you to ask yourself this question, not out loud. Are you growing as a Christian? Now think about that. Are you growing as a Christian? As God began to speak to my heart about this particular passage, I began to realize, you know, I need to be growing closer to Him. I need to be becoming more like Him. Well, let's look in verse 1. To Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that hath attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, speak to our hearts. Give us what we have need of today and show us what you have in your word. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. What you notice the very first statement. It says, Simon Peter. Now, I want you to think about this. Which name did the Lord call Peter? Once, but he usually referred to him as Peter. When did he call him Simon Peter? When he got in trouble. Yeah. You know, it's like John, what's your middle name? Western? Okay. That's why you act the way you do. Okay. Uh, Edith, I'm sorry you had to put up with him. I really am. Uh, but I want you to think about this. When we as kids got in trouble, Nathaniel, what's your middle name? Edward. Okay, Nathaniel and Edward. Yeah, I bet you did. I bet you did. I know you when you were growing up. I know you got called a lot. When our full name is being used, usually it means we're in trouble. But look at what Peter did. He called himself Simon Peter, not just Peter, but notice the second word. It says a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. A Peter, he's coming before the people, and it tells us the group that he's writing to, and we'll look at this in just a moment. 
But Peter is writing a letter or an epistle. This was an open epistle to a group of people. But he calls himself, first of all, a servant. I am a servant of the Almighty God. I am nobody. And then he lists that and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the apostle was a pretty big thing. You had to be alive, and, and during the time of Christ, you had to witness his death on the cross, and you had to witness his resurrection. Now, we've got some older people in here, and uh, Brother Charles, you're older, but you never saw the death of Christ, did you? You know what? According to the Bible, you're not an apostle. You can't be. You know, if you heard churches today, oh, apostle so-and-so is the pastor. Folks, that's a bunch of baloney. You know why? You've got to be alive during the time of Christ. You've got to be taught by Christ. And you've got to witness uh, His resurrection and death. But folks, Peter is saying... Okay, first of all, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. Oh, but by the way, I'm an apostle. That's my official title, and I want everybody to know. And he's writing to a group of Christians. He's saying, I want to share with you some things that I want you to be doing, that I want you to see And, you know, as I began to go down through this, I remember reading a statement by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of all time. He made the statement and he said to his preacher boys, if you're going to understand a passage, read it a hundred times before you preach it. Nathaniel, have you ever heard that? That's what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, if you want to know a passage, read it a hundred times. You know what? The more I got into this passage, the more I began to say, wow, this is awesome. This is, uh, is mind-blowing. But I'm going to give you three things that God gives us. Number one, he gives us a divine call. A divine call. I want you to notice verse 1 and 2. It says, Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle, this is the introduction, of Jesus Christ. Notice this, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to look at something. He tells us, to them that have like precious faith. He gives us a divine call. He gives us a call that we need to be serving Him. Three things here that I want to give you about this divine call. First of all, it's precious faith. Notice what it says here. uh, Who obtain like precious faith. You know what precious faith is? Our salvation. When we get saved, there is a divine call to us that we need to get saved. little Cassie. Boy, it was good to be able to spend some time with them this week. And and, um, I spent a lot of time talking with Cassie this week about her relationship with God. I I talked to her about uh, going to heaven. And what brought it on, we were talking about my mother's death. And we were talking about things. You know, kids, they see things and they know things. And you know what I've learned over the years? You learn what has happened, and you teach what's real. And I began to just talk with Cassie, and she talked about uh, her great-grandmother and uh, talked about she saw the funeral, she saw the whole thing, and, and 
Cassie began to ask questions. And I began to talk to Cassie, and I knew God was, was speaking to her heart. I began to talk to her about her salvation. I knew she was ready, and I could have led her to the Lord this week, but you know what? I said, no, I want mom and dad to have that privilege. But you know what? God was calling her to salvation. There was a precious call that was going out, and you could tell God was doing something. Folks, if you don't have that call, if you don't have that precious faith, you are not saved. But I want you to see the second point uh, in the divine call. Not only is it a precious faith, but it's a precious value. Notice what it says here. Through the righteousness of God. Folks, you know how and why we have our salvation? It's through Jesus Christ. You know, aren't you glad, Bill, aren't you glad that we don't have to be good enough to get saved? Boy, some of you, Shane, you'd have a hard time, wouldn't you? Uh, oh, Shane, you're not good enough. I'm sorry. I'm not even going to mention my back row Baptist friend back there. Oh, you, you, uh, you're not good enough. Oh, I know. If you have enough money, you can get into heaven. That's what one particular religion, I'm not going to mention that, they tell their people when someone dies. If my mom had been part of this religion, the priest would have come to me and said, for X amount of dollars, I will guarantee to get your loved one from paradise into heaven. Folks, that's not Bible. It's not Bible. You cannot buy to get into heaven. Oh, I've had a lot of people over the years, oh, preacher, uh, I, I want to get baptized or I want to do this. Folks, that does not get you into heaven. It is a precious value that we have. It is the greatest gift that we can ever get is the gift of salvation. But I want you to see the third thing. It's a gift of precious life. Look down, verse 2, it says, And grace and peace be multiplied unto you. This is simply an acknowledgment. But I want you to notice the next little statement. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, we have a precious life. We have a life that's everlasting. We have a life that will never end. We have a life that God says, I want to give to you. I want to give you this eternal life. I want to give you. You don't deserve it. Boy, Ken Scoggins does not deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be called a child of God. I don't deserve to have the righteousness of God in me. But He gives it to me. It's a divine call, and He calls us, first of all, precious faith. we got to get saved. we got to realize, I'm a sinner. That's where it starts. I've dealt with kids so much that I've talked to them about their sin. And if a child says this, you ask them if they've ever done anything wrong, and they don't know, or they think they're okay, they think they're perfect, folks, they're not ready yet. When a person realizes, I am a sinner, I have done something wrong, that's when we get the divine call. That's when God is speaking to our heart. But you know, I'm not going to really dwell on this in this passage. But you know what happens when God gives that divine call and we don't answer. You know, there's a lot of people that are in our world today that God has spoken to and they've turned away. And folks, if they don't get saved, if they don't turn back, they're going to end up in hell. Now, I can't say, I can't show you from the Word of God, but the Bible does tell us we cross a deadline, we cross a threshold, God says, no more, I'm not, gonna, 
I'm not going to speak to your heart. It's not that he doesn't want to give his salvation. is we've rejected him so much. We've turned away. You know, I, I've seen people like this over the years. Oh, preacher, I don't want that. I don't need that. Oh, uh, that's just a bunch of uh, baloney. I don't want to get saved. I'm okay. Oh, I pity that person. I pity them. First of all, we receive a divine call. Number two, He gives us a divine power. Go down to verse 3. According to His divine power, hath He given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, and through the knowledge of Him that is called to us to glory and virtue. As Peter is writing, as God is moving in the Spirit, the Bible tells us that men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write down the things we have in our Bible. It not, it's not just a book about God. It is the Word of God. It is God speaking to our hearts. But the first thing, or second thing I want you to see, we have a divine power. Not only do we have a divine call, but we have a divine power. Three things I want to show you. First of all, we have a power to live for Christ. What do you think about this? Did you know we have a power to live? Notice what it says here. It says, according to His divine power... Hath He given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness and through the knowledge of Him. Now, here's what God is saying in His Word. I want to have you grow as a Christian. I'm going to teach you the things of God and I'm going to help you as you grow. And remember, this is Simon Peter. This is the, the disciple that denied Jesus. Three times. This is written after that. This is written much later in Peter's life. Peter looks back at his life and he says, You know, I did all of this for the glory of God. I did all of this. And of all people, I don't deserve heaven. But the closer I get to knowing the Lord the more I began to realize He's given me a divine power. He's given me something in my life. And I want you to think about this for just a moment. I, I, I tell you this all the time, but I want to get it to sink in. Once you get saved, or when you get saved, I should say, you have all of God that you will ever need your entire life. I want you to listen carefully. There's a lot of people who talk about the filling of the Spirit of God. Did you know you're filled with the Spirit of God the moment you get saved? You have all of God in you that you will ever need. Let me, let me give you an illustration of this. How many have a garden? Would you raise your hand? You've got a garden. Okay. How many started with seeds? Bill, you didn't start with seeds, you started with plants? Both. Both, okay. Now, when you take a little seed, I used to have a garden, but I got too aggravated with it, I quit. But I was teaching my boys about planting corn. You put corn in the ground, and it's a little kernel of corn. One of my boys was saying, Dad, I want to eat some corn. We said, well, it's going to take some time. You got to put that in the ground. That little seed has to die. But guess what happens? A corn stalk grows out of that seed. One day I was taking my son out in the yard and I was showing him in the garden and I was showing him, hey, look, we've got some corn growing on our corn stalk. Began to show them, but it started with a little seed. You see, that's what happens in us. The seed of God comes in and begins to grow and work and move. And we get a moving of the Spirit of God, and it's God's power. And you know what happens? 
we began to grow and we began to, to do things. Give you three things. First of all, He's given us a power to live for Christ. Romans chapter 6 deals with the idea that we don't have to be bound by sin. You know, folks, if I would ask how many sin we all do, how many sin yesterday we all would say we did, how many sin today some of us would say we've been too perfect, we haven't sinned, you just did. Uh, but here's the thing. Here's what God is saying. I want you to understand, I want to give you the power to live godly. Notice this phrase. It says, pertain unto life and goodness, godliness. Or, notice this. Here's what God said. I want to take your life. And I want to share with you, I want to show you, I want to help you in all that you're doing. But I want to give you power. The second power he gives us a power to witness. Acts 1.8. Jesus shall receive power both in Jerusalem, the othermost part of the world, and and Judea and Samaria and to the innermost part of the world. Folks, that word power means dynamite. It's a Greek word, dynamis. And it has the idea of an exploding thing in our lives. You know what God said? I'm going to give you the power to witness. Notice this, this verse. It says, According as His divine power that hath given us to all things that pertain unto life and goodliness, through the knowledge of Him, called us to glory and virtue. I want to give you power. I want to give you power to go tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the very first time you try to witness to someone, you are scared to death. But you know, after you do it over and over and over for a while, it gets a little easier. You're still scared. You're still scared to talk to someone. I have a disposition that I enjoy going and talking to people, and I don't care who they are. I don't care what they look like. I will go and, and talk to them about the Lord. Well, what happened when I was in Bible college, my bus director at the time I went visiting with him, and man, he was a great man. He was a great soul winner. One day, we were out visiting, and, uh, and, and please listen, I'm not prejudiced when I say this, but there was a big black guy that we went, and we went to the door, and he came. I mean, he was, he was huge. This friend of mine, he pushed me up and he said, hey, this guy wants to know what happens if you die right now. Where are you going to go? And push me up there. Man, I was just as scared as that guy was. And I fumbled around with the words. And, but you know what? I became bolder in my testimony. I would go talk to people that uh, you wouldn't normally talk to. I met up with a group of hell's angels and talked with them. I, I'm a, 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 a honorary chaplain to the Pagan's Motorcycle Gang. Say, preacher, who do, you, who do you hang out with? I go see people, anyone who's say, unsaved, that I can talk to. I want to talk to them. You say, why? I've got a power to witness. It's inside of me. I want to talk to people. My wife gets aggravated. I get in an elevator and people say, going up? I say, yes, sir. And I start looking around. How about you? She wants to cringe and crawl out and slip out underneath the door. You know, in an elevator, you're going up. It's kind of awkward to talk with people because you're in this little thing. I, I was in a big high-rise one time. 
and just for fun, I pushed all the buttons so I could talk to everybody going up. Power to witness. Power to talk to people. You say, preacher, I don't have that kind of power. If you have God, you have that power. It's in you. You say, I, 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 I can't talk to folks. I'm, I'm not that way. Folks, if you'd let God take control, God can use you and reuse you to reach people, but there's a power to witness. And then thirdly, there's a power to grow. John chapter 15 talks about growing and producing fruit and bearing fruit in our lives. You know what He does? The Bible talks about this. He wants us to bear fruit, but He not only wants us to bear fruit, He wants us to bear much fruit. And here is the key to this particular passage. God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow with the power that's in us. Folks, listen to me. It's not a worked up power. There's a lot of churches today that are built on emotion. Boy, they get you so hyped up. They bring you up and they bring you down and they bring you back up again and they bring you down. I'm afraid many of our so-called revivals are all based on emotions and not based on the Son of God and based on what Jesus Christ does. Folks, power does not mean you get up and run up and down the aisles like a crazy person. doesn't mean that you uh, are speaking in tongues. Boy, that's a good one. I've had a lot of people over the years tell me, Oh, I, I know I'm a Christian. I spoke in tongues. Folks, tongues as a literal meaning are languages. Hey, I speak in tongues every time I speak. It's a language. It's not something that is uh, abstract and foreign. And uh, Oh, I had one person tell me, Oh, I speak in tongues so I can speak like an angel. Hey, that's not what God said. See, God gave the apostles and the early church the ability to be able to reach and talk to everyone. On the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God fell and came, uh, they had uh, we were able to speak in tongues so that every language you read in, in first and Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, you, you see that everyone heard in their own language the gospel of salvation. Now I want you to notice carefully, the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and these shall cease. They're not going to have all of the spiritual gifts because we don't need them. Folks, we don't need the gift of healing. Boy, wouldn't it be great to be a healer and be able to heal people like the Apostle Paul or, or even Peter? Peter, uh, it was known that he healed Dorcas. Uh, Peter uh, was able to, uh, they, they even put their, their beds out so the shadow of Peter would come by and that would heal him. We don't have that today. There was a man by the name of Oral Roberts who started Oral Roberts University out in Oklahoma, said he was a faith healer. Oh, I can heal people. Oh, all I got to do is call on the name of God. Oh, yeah, he built a hospital that cost millions of dollars for people to be able to go to. Oh, we'll heal you. But you got to come to my hospital. Oh, after you come to my hospital, you got to give. He's the one who said, unless I get a million dollars for my ministry, God's going to take me home. I said, take him home. Listen, or I guess it was 10 million or something. I don't know. I forget what the millions was. Don't you think about this? We don't need those gifts any longer. 
Well, I'd love to heal people of cancer. Cancer's a horrible thing. I'm a cancer survivor. I can talk about that. I know. You know, folks, let me caution you. You can't talk to someone about their needs unless you know what they're going through. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine the other day. He asked me, he said, how are you doing since your mom died? I said, I'll be honest, I've got a hole in my heart. I've got a hole in my heart. Mama's gone. My dad died 30 years ago, and to be honest, I was glad he died. He was so much of a torment to me. You know, when mom died, it hurt. I didn't really realize how much mom had an influence on my boy's life. Charles, you were there. You heard the testimonies. My mom meant something. My mom did something. My mom was special. When she was in her right mind, she was a prayer warrior. Oh, she'd pray. She had a long list of names and people that she'd be praying for. She wrote emails to people all over the world. At one time, she was telling me she had uh, almost a million emails that she was sending out every week. I've got a hole in my heart. It's tough. It's hard. And we don't understand that until we've gone through it. Don't come to someone and say, I understand what you're going through unless you've been there. But Peter said, I want to grow. I want to grow in God. I failed God. I got away from God. I, I sinned. The Bible tells us that Peter went out and wept bitterly after he denied the Lord. But he's writing to Christians. He says, I want to share with you what God has given me. Then we come down to the third thing. Go down to verse 4. It says, And whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by ye you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I want you to notice the little phrase there, precious promises. Peter said he's given us divine promises. Let me give you three promises that God gives us. He gives us promises for our daily living. I want to be with you. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Casting all of your care upon me, he careth for you. I will hear your prayers. I will answer your prayers. I will give you what you have need of. Call upon me, and I will answer thee. Those are promises for daily living. Folks, I want you to listen carefully, and we'll see this as we get on into Second Peter. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the harder it's going to get. Persecution is coming. Folks, we have not seen anything as of yet. It's coming. You say, don't you think the coming of the Lord is right now? Yes, I do. But folks, if God tarries His coming, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. That's what Peter saw. But he said, I'm going to give you some promises. First thing is promises for our daily living. Number two, he gives us promises for our spiritual living. I want to encourage you 
to understand what Peter was talking about. Notice what it says here in verse 4. That by ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Folks, we have spiritual promises that He's given to us. That's fighting the devil. That's using the Word of God. That's having the idea that we're escaped from the corruption of sin. That's growing. You know, sometimes we come to church. Sometimes it seems that the preacher's messages are dwelt or or, or aimed just right at me. Seems like God is just directing. I know sometimes I call out names. My son used to tell me, don't do that. People don't like that. It's God. I'm not condemning anybody about their sin. I'm not saying uh, you're a bigger sinner than I am. I'm saying we all are sinners. We all do things that are wrong in the sight of God. You know what happens? We began to realize God's given us a promise for spiritual living. Hey, we're in a battle. This battle is raging around about us. And folks, we are seeing this right now in our country. We are divided as a country. We are divided. And you know what? Is getting more on the other side than on our side. You say, why? Because Christians are not willing to take a stand for what's wrong and what's right. Hey, gay marriage is wrong. Being a lesbian, being a homosexual is wrong. You say, why? According to the Word of God. It's not because I'm judging. It's not because I'm hating. Boy, they're trying to push it. They're trying to say, if you preach on that, Nathaniel, you watch, we'll get cut off from Facebook. You know why? They don't like that kind of language. Oh, you don't like uh, 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 a homosexual? Okay. Uh, go back and what the Bible calls them in the Word of God. Well, they don't like that. They don't like the Word of God. They don't like what God calls them. You know what? God doesn't like for two men to be married. God doesn't like for two women to be married. God said a man and a woman. God said He doesn't want us to live like the devil. We are in a battle. We're raging. Oh, it cracks me up. Please excuse me. I'm not being disrespectful for anyone. But there are women today that are saying, it's my body, it's my choice. I can have an abortion if I want one. Then they turn around and they say, you have to take a vaccine. You have to take a shot. You have to do this and you have to do that. Oh, but it's my body I choose. Hey, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it, uh, I'll choose for an abortion, but I'll not choose for an, uh, a vaccine. That's, that's mandatory. You know what? They found out. All that evac- evac- uh, vaccination was a bunch of baloney. It didn't do anything. My leg doctor went to Spain for a vacation. She came back with COVID. I was in the office just the other day talking to her. I said, heard you got sick. She said, yeah, I got sick coming back. And... Uh, She said, it's everywhere. She said, you can get it anywhere. It's everywhere. But folks, the promises for spiritual living. Let me give you the last thing. Promises for eternal living. I want to tell you, based on the Word of God, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I want to tell you, when we leave this world, we are going to a home that is greater 
than we can ever imagine. I said my goodbyes to my mother, and I whispered in her ear. I said, you're going home to see Jesus. I'm jealous. She's perfect. Oh, in my eyes, my mother always was perfect, I know. She's in heaven. She's with God. Peter was getting close to death when he wrote 2 Peter. But God was using him like never before. He said, I want you to grow. I want you to open up. I want you to look at the divine call. I want you to look at the divine power. I want you to look at the divine promises. It's right here in the Word of God. It's what God gave us. It's what God gives to us. So many times we push it aside. So many times we say, well, that's for the children, or that's not for me. Folks, if you're a child of God, it's for you. Three things that God's given us. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes, if you will.